Okay, so this lecture is going to look at the genetics within the cell as they pertain to plants and the study of um, chromosomes, really, and their behavior, how they affect the phenotype and genotype of different plants. So what is cytogenetics? It is the study of chromosome behavior and structure from a genetic point of view. So looking at um, how these genes then affect the um, physical structure, the characteristics of plants. <clears throat> there are different ways in which chromosomes can be changed within a genome. Um, some of them may be inversions where that's where we have an example here where a piece of a chromosome um, was removed, flipped, and then put back into a, a different chromosome or the same chromosome. Okay, and another one is called translocation. So this would be like the same thing happening where this chunk would be um, moved into a different part of a different chromosome and then this chromosome would be smaller. Um, both of these can help to cause speciation. Um, depending on, if, you know, if this is a lethal mutation then it's going to cause um, death in the, the um, gametes and so it won't produce anything but if it is a beneficial translocation it can help to improve um, chances of natural selection towards an individual so these these can help create differences between um, subspecies which then can cause s speciation okay some other um, other things in cytogenetics include transposition which is the movement of a chromosome piece to another chromosome location. Um, and similar to translocation, only this is, this is usually much, much smaller. Um, this was discovered by Barbara McClintock in the 1950s. And really small piece fragments are called transposable elements and they move to a new location. And you can have this speckling effect in corn um, seeds. Um, which causes different coloration in different kernels of corn. Um, and that's because of transposable elements, genes that have um, little fragments which have moved out of one piece of DNA into another chromosome. So sometimes uh, there are errors in meiosis which will cause chromosome numbers to double or half or triple or quadruple um, <clears throat> and sometimes you will have uh, just one chromosome that d does this sometimes you will have a whole genome do this so if the whole genome does it then you have a polyploid um, event okay where you start with a diploid organism and then somehow through meiosis rather than these chromosomes splitting to different sides they both go to the same side um, and then fertilization would lead to a triploid or if you have both egg and sperm as diploid then you have a tetraploid okay and these usually have a higher yield if you have a polyploid event um, aneuploidy is just when maybe one of these so let's say this yellow chromosome doubles well all the other ones stay the same or this yellow chromosome is somehow deleted and all the other ones will stay the same so polyploidy events usually uh, often have a larger yield <clears throat> and this is um, found in a lot of the plants that we eat. Cotton, potato, peanuts, wheat, oats, strawberry, and sugarcane all have these bigger fruits, these bigger structures with lots of um, usable material in there such as starch um, which we use in our agriculture. So, um, the first person who really discovered genetics was Gregor Mendel, where he crossed different varieties of peas, including tall and short peas, in the 1860s. So, he denoted the parental ger generation as capital P, and he found that all offspring were tall. The first filial generation, or the offspring of the parent generation, parental ger generation, was called the F1 generation. Um, crossing the offspring yielded a ratio of three tall individuals to one short individual. So um, he was 
trying to figure out, well, where did that short individual come from? When he um, then did a second filial generation where he took the offspring of the F1 plants and interbred them, he also found this same, uh, this same pattern. So all tall offspring led to this three to one ratio. All right, so some of the things that Mendel discovered, um, he were later formed into what we call laws. So the law of unit character is, is that factors or alleles control the inheritance of characters. And the locus is the location of a gene. So an allele which codes for a character um, is, on, uh, is found on a gene at the locus. Uh, the law of dominance, he found that some alleles were dominant to other alleles, where if you had both of them in a genome, one from each parent, the dominant allele would mask the expression of the recessive, and you would not get expression of the recessive allele. So the phenotype then is the physical appearance of the genes, and the genotype are the actual genes which are in the um, organism. And you can be homozygous, which would be a genotype where both alleles are identical. So you can be homozygous recessive or homozygous do dominant. Or you can be heterozygous where you have maybe one dominant and one recessive allele. Okay, so an example here, you have a pure breeding purple flower where it has two dominant um, alleles. If you um, cross that with a <coughs> A uh, flower that has two recessive alleles, it will give a heterozygote where the dominant is expressed and the recessive is not. All right, so um, another experiment Mendel did where he, he is he took two um, uh, true breeding parents, which are homozygous for different traits and then produced a heterozygous generation. So see, these were all the same. And then for the uh, F2 generation, he did a monohybrid cross, um, and it resulted in a one to two to one genotypic ratio and a three to one phenotypic ratio. All right, <clears throat> the dihybrid cross then looks at two different traits. Um, and what he found, what he came up with was called the law of independent assortment, where is that those two traits um, are not associated with each other. They will independently segregate and um, you will not necessarily, if you are tall, have green flowers, that they will be independent. Um, but he did, however, there are some genes that are linked. Those that are on the same chromosome are more likely to be associated with each other. So that does not apply to the law of independent assortment. Unlinked genes are found on different chromosomes, and those would be the ones that would segregate independently. So what he did, we found an F1 generation composed of dihybrids, meaning they're hybrid of both. And then it produced four different types of gametes, depending on whether they had a recessive and a recessive, or dominant recessive, or dominant recessive of the other two flipped, or dominant dominant. Um, and then he used the Punnett square to determine the types of genotypes and phenotypes. And the phenotypes should be 93 to 3 to 1 ratio. If you have um, heterozygote F1 offspring to make uh, in the F2 offspring. All right. Um, as I mentioned before, some genes are linked. And each gene has a specific location called the locus on a chromosome. Crossing over is more likely to occur if the genes are close to each other, right? So A and B are both close to each other. So if you have a crossing over event, if they're really close to each other, it's more likely that they'll stay together. So you can use that to determine how close genes are by uh, counting recombinant type types. So if you have offspring where they aren't together, you know crossing over has occurred between them. Um, and so one map unit is 
used then to determine how far apart they are. So if 1% of the time these two genes on the same chromosome are, on, are not associated with each other, then that's considered to be one map unit. And if they're further apart, then they're more likely uh, to be affected by um, crossing, over print, uh, crossing over events. So uh, a 99% crossing over event would mean that most of the time they aren't together and they would be very far apart on the chromosomes. And this is uh, information which also is used to discover the DNA sequence. Um, and to explore other genes and their functions. So some of the things you can do then to determine genetics are uh, called uh, back cross, where you cross a hybrid back to one of its parents. And what this allows you to do, because the parents were homozygous, um, you can then determine based on the progeny and the ratios what type of inheritance they have. Um, so if you go back to the parents, then you should have an expected ratio of 1 to 1, and if that's not right, then something else is going on. You can also do a test cross, is where you, you um, cross your plant with a homozygous recessive plant, and again, that will give a specific ratio in the progeny, if, depending on whether they are heterozygous, heterozygotes or homozygotes. Um, there is uh, another sort of a pattern called incomplete dominance where the two genes aren't one gene doesn't mass together but they actually make a blended so this is sometimes called blended inheritance so a heterozygote is intermediate in the phenotype to the two homozygotes okay so that occurs going back that occurs in sometimes in flower types where you have a red and a white uh, if they have a homozygous uh, they have pink so they have some of the red pigment but not all of it and rather than just one or the other So there are many traits, however, that are controlled by more than one genes, uh, more than one gene, and they have actually an interaction of a host of genes because of biochemical pot pathways which involve multiple genes and multiple proteins um, to get to their functional product. Uh, and the genotype, of course, controls the phenotype. The dominant, al dominant allele will code for the protein that produces the phenotype, and the recessive will be a mutant form where somehow the, the copying of the gene into the protein is messed up and it doesn't work and so it doesn't produce the protein. It doesn't follow the biochemical pathway to the protein. So an <clears throat> quantitative traits exhibit a range of phenotypes. So an example of this would be like fruit yield or days to flowering. So if you look at one tree as opposed to another tree of the same size, uh, you know, the number of fruits that they produce is is variable and can be continuously quantitative um, from, you know, 0 to 800 fruits, you know, and they're not going to be exactly the same. So it's a little harder to say, oh, this is tall, this is short. It's somewhere in between. And this is due to genetic differences within the plant. Uh, genetically identical plants can also produce different phenot phenotypes under different environments. So if you water this tree and don't water that tree, well, this one's going to produce more fruits. So that's just phenotype. That's not genes. So molecular geneticists identify chromosomal fragments, okay, um, which is a quantitative trait loci or QTLs associated with these quantitative traits. Okay, so a group of genes which combined will affect how much fruit is being produced by a tree. These um, QTLs then contain genes that influence the trait, which behave just like Mendelian genetics, even though there's a group of them. And this is important, of course, for agriculture, because you want to find which genes are going to be the best for producing your fruit and breed those um, and leave the others. All right, so one other thing about DNA, there are some parts of the plants which have extra nuclear DNA, so DNA outside of the nucleus is what that means. And this is found in mitochondria and, and chloroplasts. And the reason that is is because it, they are believed to have derived from um, smaller prokaryotes, which once upon a time kind of formed a symbiotic uh, relationship with a larger prokaryote um, until they became in, 
enveloped in this larger cell and became part of that cell. And this is called the endosymbiont hypothesis or endosymbiosis. Um, so these there's d these have their own DNA. They have also have their own ribosomes. They have their own plasma membrane. Um, so mitochondria and chloroplasts can uh, reproduce independently of the cell. And um, the sperm does not does carry mitochondria to help its flagella, but that um, mitochondria does not get passed into the zygote when it's fertilized. The only thing that the sperm um, inserts into the egg is its nucleus, is, it, is its um, genes, its chromosomes. So the mitochondria and chloroplasts which are in the egg then will continue to divide and um, will inhabit those cells as they um, divide and grow. And so they are maternally inherited. You inherit all your mitochondria from your mother. Um, plants inherit all its chloroplasts and mitochondria from the egg-bearing structure, uh, not from the sperm.